Okay, great. Welcome all to uh, another edition of the Psychedelic Film and, uh, and Music Festival. Today, I'm very pleased to have Frederick Marx as our guest. Uh, Frederick Marx has lived his life mission as a socially dedicated film artist for over 45 years. He's an international acclaim, Oscar and Emmy nominated producer and director. He was named a Chicago Tribune Artist of the Year, a Guggenheim Fellow and a recipient of a Robert F. Kennedy Special Achievement Award. His film, Hoop Dreams, played in hundreds of theaters nationwide after winning the Audience Award at the Sundance Film Festival and was the first documentary ever chosen to close the New York Film Festival. It was an over 110 best list nationwide and was named best film of the year by the by critics Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel and Ken Turin. Uh, Ebert also named the best film of the decade. Prestigious awards include Academy nomination, best editing, Producers Guild, Editors Guild, Peabody Awards, the Prix Italia, and the National Society of Film Critics Award. Who Dreams ignited uh, Marx's lifelong passion for the well being of youth. That led to Boys to Men, question mark 2002, a snapshot of the dire state of teen boys in the US today. Boys to Men chronicles one year the lives of three 15-year-old boys as they struggle to define themselves meaningfully as men. Soon, Marx will make his, has made his film to be a rites of passage, mentoring the future. This documentary is about solutions. It will demonstrate why it's necessary to initiate and mentor all the world's youth. It will show audiences how it can be done provide them with the tools to do it and inspire them to take up the challenge. The companion book, Rides to a Good Life, Everyday Rituals of Healing and Transformation is already available. And the link has been posted above here. The book contains a preface from Jack Cornfield. The book reflects 20 years of study and practice in multiple rites of passage and mentorship modalities. His first book, At Death Do Us Part, A Grieving Widow Heals After Losing His Wife to Breast Cancer, was endorsed by Ram Dass before his death. Mark's most recent work, Veterans Journey Home, a five film series, tells the story of the 2.7 million veteran, returning US veterans and what it takes for them to successfully transition back to civilian life. The documentary recently won best documentary at the psychedelic film and music festival welcome frederick thanks for Thank having you, me Daniel. good to be here well you know after i you i interview always a lot of different directors and producers but really your body of work could cover hundreds of hours of discussion a very meaningful and interesting discussion um when i first when, I, when I, one of our programmers brought up the documentary of uh, your documentary, uh, uh, Veterans uh, Returning Home, I was uh, first struck by the fact that you had produced and involved in Hoop Dreams. And I said, oh, where's the connection here? But now as I begin to look over your background and your, and your interests, there's a larger pattern that's emerging. And so I would, uh, if you, if you please will share this pattern with the audience. I believe your interest in initiation and in the power of transformation that comes from that, it's long in the making. Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, my interest in young people really started with hoop dreams. Uh, you know, we had the opportunity to basically see these young men grow up in front of our cameras. We filmed them for four and a half years uh, from the time they were <clears throat> 13 to the time they were 17, uh, 18. And that film left me with a really profound question. Who is out there in society who is looking out for the well-being of young people 
who was not interested in exploiting them in some way, not interested in having them fulfill their own denied ambitions, uh, their own hopes and dreams, but are actually nourishing them to generate their own hopes and dreams and then to help them fulfill those. So, you know, and you see that quite clearly in Hoop Dreams. I mean, there's certainly some figures, uh, particularly the mothers of both of the boys who, you know, really do nurture them as individuals uh, and, and want to see them uh, flourish uh, in their uniqueness. But most of the other people that you see, a lot of the coaches and certainly the agents and even some family members um, are more interested in sort of how they can uh, ride on the coattails of the successes of these young men. So anyway, that, that was the concern that that film left me with. And it was around the same time uh, that that film was released, that I did what I consider to be my own initiation into what I call mature masculinity. Uh, because I was not uh, initiated or mentored as a, as a teen, when all teens, I believe, deserve it um, and rightfully should receive it. Uh, you know, my father died when I was nine. And uh, none of my extended family, not my uncle, nobody basically was there for me to help mentor me across that threshold from adolescence into young adulthood. So, uh, so I did uh, the weekend workshop called the New Warrior Training Adventure with a group called the Mankind Project in 1995 in Chicago in October of that year. And so those two streams, if you will, kind of started to flow together for me. So I started asking myself, well, what does it take for young men in particular? And then my interest grew to encompass young women as well to cross that threshold. You know, what do they require in the way of, you know, culturally appropriate pro-social rites of passage, initiations into adulthood, and who is there to mentor them. So the first film I made, uh, and you mentioned it, Boys to Men, question mark, um, was in a sense a an analysis of the problem because I filmed a number of 15 and 16 year old boys in and around Newark, New Jersey for two years in 2000 and 2001. And in the middle of making that film, I realized, you know, I need to make a film about solutions. <laughs> I don't need to just make one about the problems uh, because these problems of boys being uninitiated and unmentored are almost universal. I mean, you look everywhere in society and the dysfunctions of teen boys are present. Uh, in, you know, over drinking, over drugging, reckless driving, uh, unprotected sex. I mean, you name it. There's so many ways. So anyway, that it was at that point that I began what later became my Rites of Passage film. Uh, so that film is available on our website at warriorfilms.org. Uh, it's called Rites of Passage, Mentoring the Future. It's only 11 minutes long. My original vision for the film was to make it 100 minutes. And in fact, that's what I hope to do uh, later this year. I've actually started it three or four times over the last 16 years, uh, but I never succeeded in raising the funds that I needed to complete it. So it's about a third finished at this point, but I did not wait to write the companion book. And so the companion book is now done. And you mentioned it, and it's available on Amazon and elsewhere called Rights to a Good Life. And so it looks at the necessity to mentor and initiate teens universally across cultures and across the planet. So that's pretty much how I got to this point today. 
Now, your interest in initiation then goes uh, in initiating teens uh, now overlaps into the other groups as well. I mean, you've also, you're, through your warrior film series, you're, you're exploring how veterans, uh, and as you mentioned in an earlier talk, how uh, there is an incomplete initiation you refer to. Yes. Uh, the idea of going to war and returning back to civilian life. And so please tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, so, excuse me, my interest in veterans began in 2005 when I was invited to uh, do some filming, but also staff a workshop outside of Houston called Veterans Journey Home. Okay. And that's what first introduced me to the, the issues surrounding veterans. And then I started reading more and more about it. In particular, I read uh, the books of Ed Tick um, called Warriors Return. Uh, that's uh, one of them. And also uh, War and the Soul. Uh, wonderful books. And now I've since read, you know, whatever, 30, 40 more books on similar subjects. And I learned from these various teachers that veterans are in effect stuck in the middle of a rite of passage. And the reason why there's so much dysfunction on the part of vets is largely not so much due to their own psychological problems. Uh, the problem that they have is, uh, returning back to a society that does not know how to receive them. And what we do, what we need to do to receive them properly is to give them uh, welcoming return rituals. So we basically as communities need to step forward and provide uh, ceremonies that allow veterans to uh, share with us all of what they've experienced and all of the betrayals and the horrors and the disappointments and the joys uh, of their service. And to then symbolically uh, take the load of carrying all of that off of their own shoulders and put it on the collective so that we as a community can help them hold this. And they have a lot to teach us about the real uh, truth of what war involves, uh, because you know, with our society today, there's so much misperception of what real war is about, and it's largely been created, of course, by both government and by Hollywood. You know, there's all these myths of heroes, and you know, I grew up with the John Wayne myth. You know, the lone male hero who, you know, does whatever he needs to do to save the country. So, uh, so we have a lot of work to do to counterbalance these myths and to uh, effectively and meaningfully complete the rite of passage for these veterans and welcome them home. There is uh, currently in the, in the field a desire to help them and uh, a lot of the reach has been, for instance, the FDA has approved an MDMA program and um, because they, they're finally recognizing that a lot of the, a lot of these traditional big pharma is just ain't, it's not working. Um, and uh, they are, they certainly want to, introduce, but uh, we talk about millions of veterans and, you know, we always argue, well, we say, well, how are you going to? do this. I mean, we're not talking about 10 or 100 or 1,000 millions. So there certainly have to be various modalities that need to be introduced simultaneously to reach out to them because MDMA may not necessarily work for uh, some veterans and their follow-up may not even be there. It's not just taking a pill. I think we're used to taking a pill and expecting to feel great. And this to all this uh, initiation and this desire to integrate is something that takes a little bit of time and, and work. As, as, and yes, and uh, you know, I very um, consciously chose not to focus on some of these uh, long overdue and quite successful therapies 
uh, for veterans like MDMA, like psilocybin, uh, like LSD. And now finally, you know, the government has taken uh, the, uh, the locks off of allowing these tests to go forward. So it's extremely good news. And there is uh, emerging uh, evidence that these things are very effective and successful. But again, I chose not to focus on those because ultimately I think what is really required is something as simple as veterans telling their stories in a kind of a ritual space where they are compassionately witnessed by citizens. So that's really, there, there's, no, <laughs> there's no great secret here. Right. Um, you know, we can do that in public spaces all across the country. Um, uh, you know, whether it's in, you know, VFW halls or whether it's in community uh, centers or whether it's in school auditoriums, we can do it anywhere and everywhere. Uh, and that is the common feature of the, of the four or five different healing modalities, if you want to call them that, that I focus on in my series of films. Uh, they all come back to that commonality of being compassionately witnessed. Uh, so, uh, well, I'll leave it there. The, and the, the, the healing modalities you're referring to, are there specific, are there uh, non-medicinal uh, or do they incorporate medicinal? No, no, they don't. That's, that's what I'm talking about. So I didn't focus on those medicinal right. ones, but... Um, I will say that, you know, in my experience and learning about veterans, that is, there's a number of thresholds, if you will, they have to cross on that long journey back to wholeness, back to fulfilled civilian life. And one of those first thresholds, I believe, is an understanding that the meds that they are largely prescribed due to uh, their illness of PTS, which is a whole nother discussion I have a lot of problems with, right. but is to step away from those big pharma drugs that are, for many of them, um, turning them into zombies. Now, I, I, I will say that there are a few, you know, who get some help and some relief from those drugs, and God bless them. But the vast majority of vets that I've met and worked with do not. Right. And basically all of their symptoms are simply drugged and masked. And it does not affect, uh, it, it doesn't help them achieve their journey back to wholeness. All it does is suspend them in a twilight zone of, of uh, uh, zombie nut. <laughs> so, so these different modalities that we focus on uh, are just kind of different forms of ritual healing. So one of them, you know, the film that you recognize with your award uh, is based on an ancient um, indigenous people ceremony where uh, veterans go out on the land uh, for four days solo, all alone with minimal uh, support. So they just take a sleeping bag and a tarp. They have water, but no food. And then they fast for four days. And basically, you can, at some level, you can think of it as a kind of a cleansing ceremony. But, but basically, the idea is to reintegrate w w their souls into their body. Because so much of a veterans' journeys through uh, service disconnect their right. souls from their own bodies. So so the, anyway, so that's one that we focus on in that film called Leaving It on the Land. But there are others that are as simple as a weekend workshop. And in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Patricia Clayson, and also in Texas, you know, they do wonderful weekend workshops uh, called Healing Warrior Hearts, where the same thing takes place in its own way where veterans tell their stories and they're compassionately witnessed. So, uh, so there are a number uh, of these different uh, healing modalities that are out there. And I just wanted to highlight a few. 
And these, uh, the Warrior series films, are there, um, in, uh, can they be seen? I mean, like the docu we have this, the documentary that we premiered, uh, it was, uh, has, it was shown, but if someone wanted to find out a little bit more about the other modalities as well, can they, are they available or will they be available down the line? Where? Yeah, <coughs> excuse me. Um, if you go to our website, warriorfilms.org and click on Veterans Journey Home, that landing page will show you all five films okay. and give you give you updated information on the organizations that we feature in them. Uh, and there's also a page that we have that is uh, resources for veterans. Mm -hmm. And we have a long list of organizations. I think there's over almost a hundred maybe uh, of organizations and teachers, mentors that we have found that we want to promote. Uh, so those resources also exist uh, from our website. But just coincidentally, today I'm signing our very first distribution agreement um, with uh, a company based in Toronto uh, called Factory Film Studio. And they'll be distributing Leaving It on the Land, uh, the first of the five films, uh, to TV networks, um, you know, digitally, uh, and maybe even put it on DVD and put it in box stores. Uh, so it will be available uh, for sale very widely, very soon. And that's, and then we'll be following that with the other four films, which are done basically at this point, we'll just be rolling them out uh, in a staggered uh, basis. Well, that's really, yeah. That's well, I'm, I'm just gonna also say though that uh, we also, in a parallel fashion, we're gonna have an outreach campaign so, you know, we're a nonprofit organization, uh, Warrior Films, where our mission is bearing witness, creating change, <laughs> which is perfectly congruent with what we're talking about, right? right. So, so we're going to reach out to hundreds, if not a thousand or more veteran organizations throughout the United States and offer these films to them uh, on a low cost basis to basically uh, allow the films to do their own job of informing people and directly healing people as they screen them in, uh, in small groups and then have facilitated conversations afterwards. So that, we're doing that as well. That's just fantastic news that I, I'm hearing from you because I do think that uh, a lot of, uh, I, would, I would imagine that as a veteran who is sees another veteran go through his journey he himself reaches some degree of closure maybe not as much as the original one in the documentary but he comes a little bit closer what are what kind of thoughts or and any have you, have you shared or have you had private screenings with other veterans and what are having the reactions after watching uh your film yeah we, we we haven't had nearly as many yet as we would like because of covid right um, it's been a little bit problematic, but the the few screenings that we have mounted just for veterans have been deeply impactful, deeply. And, um, and you're so right. I mean, one of the key messages of these films, well, l let me take a big step back. So in a sense with these films, uh, due to our social mission at Warrior Films, we're trying to reach and influence three different key audience segments. So uh, one, of course, is veterans themselves. And we want veterans to see these films to just learn, if nothing else, they're not alone. Right. Because that is toxic. You know, so many veterans come home and they just think, I'm fucked up. Something is wrong with me. And in fact, it's not true. What's wrong is a society, as I said, that doesn't know how to receive them. So, so we think we can impact veterans quite a bit and help them a lot. But we also want to influence uh, policymakers. Right. So we want to influence government officials. We want to influence people in the Pentagon. We want to influence people in the Veterans Administration. 
uh, and we and and doctors and psychologists, you know, so that they can understand with a kind of a broader, more constructive framework of what it is veterans are actually experiencing and not just go, oh, you have some disease, it's called PTSD, here, take some drugs. No. So we want to try to put an end to that. And then, of course, the third group is average citizens, because average citizens have a very important role to play in this. And that is we have to be willing to sit down with veterans and listen, as I've said, compassionately to their stories. And frankly, most citizens are not willing to do that. They do not want to, one, recognize their own complicity, first of all, in what these veterans have experienced, because we as taxpayers, if nothing else, support the efforts that pay for these veterans to, to go overseas and do what they do in our name, right? So that, that's one, is the complicity. But secondly, there's also the fear. Most citizens are afraid, frankly, to hear the truth about warfare. And that is, to put it bluntly, cowardly, because right. we have to accept responsibility for what they're doing in our name. So that means when they come home, we damn well better be willing to sit down and listen to them and learn the realities of the warfare that they've experienced. And the ultimate goodness that will come from that is not only how it helps veterans, but it'll help awaken citizens so that hopefully right. in the future we'll wipe off all of this cultural programming of John Wayne and we'll realize, no, I'm not going to send these young men and women in my name to do this military service overseas no it's 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 not it's not serving the 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 health of me of the veterans of the country of the planet as a whole so that hopefully we'll begin to foreclose on so many military adventures that we have and it's amazing that hollywood a very, there are very few films out there that i'm aware of that really have explored the uh, uh, live action or, or even documentary like yours that have explored the, uh, the, the, the story of the veterans, the P whether it be PTSD or the, the, the difficulty. I mean, I remember uh, years back, and this is not even dealing with PTSD, but this is a film, uh, Ordinary People, which obviously dealt with, uh, and I know in a way you could almost say this is a, a young man going through a, uh, a crisis, a kind of a, but there are very few films that really deal, even plays or even anything that 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 approaches that. You know, when we uh, did our first uh, festival uh, in 2018, we actually uh, we put together a small play, and uh, we were very, uh, which is a the, uh, the psychedelic journey of Timothy X from PTSD to healing. It was a play, and and. What I find very interesting is we had a, an audience of uh, veterans. Some of them were current. Some of them were actually uh, will, will be deployed, and others were, have been, and they loved it. And so clearly, the the work that you're doing is it's really very important because I think as a nation we're uh, we're really lacking this kind of awareness. It's, it's kind of a I can't help but think about all those uh, you know. And this obviously you said it earlier, going back to this has been going for a long time. Remember World War One, when you have these thousands of European men marching to war, and, and you can see their big smiles on their faces. And I'm asking myself, what a, what were they thinking? That they, it was going to be a picnic, and of course, what the, the what happens afterwards is a disaster. But it seems like we really, it seems like we need your work is to constantly. Is it so essential to remind and people and inform them about the the, the tragedy? Oh, that that often people encounter during these. Uh, what uh, I want one one person has asked me one of the participants here this when you interviewing these veterans for the film, did you end up coaching anyone to help them move through their emotional trauma? You know, it's interesting. I appreciate that question. Uh, it actually started about twenty years ago when I was filming Boys to Men in New Jersey. 
I started reconceptualizing and uh, my own work, and I well, I'll, t I'll tell you. I mean, one of the um, women that I filmed um, was the mother of this teen boy. Uh, his name is Alteran Bui, uh, and uh, his mother's name is Robin Bui. Bui. Anyway, about halfway through the filming, she said to me, she said, Frederick, you know, every time you come around and you interview me and we talk about my son, I end up going away understanding my son better. I actually understand my own son more deeply. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then later, her son, Alteran, basically said something similar to me about his mother that he appreciates her point of view more when it's kind of filtered back through me in the questions that I would uh, give to him and talk with him about. So I ended up realizing that part of my mission as a filmmaker needs to be helping my subjects along their own growth toward greater wholeness and fulfillment. And and why does that happen? Because of bearing witness. You know, there's something that is beautiful that we all do uh, when we simply open heartedly bear witness to the suffering that uh, our friends, family members and acquaintances have. So this is what I do with my films. I just hold up a mirror to them that is a very compassionate mirror, but in effect shows them their own life and that they can then use this to reflect on, well, you know what? I, I need to make a few changes here and they'll help me grow and become more fulfilled. So that's what I aim for now with my film. So not only the product, the end film itself, right. has social utility, but the process, the, the process. way that I work with subjects also I think helps, if you will, not heal them, that's too strong a term, but move them toward wholeness. Now, how will you describe the current uh, uh, structure of uh, the current outreach program towards veterans right now? Is it very fr much fragmented with little pods all over the country? Or is there a unified agenda that, that are incorporating these various um, technologies and various uh, uh, modalities. I mean, how? what is the current state right now? Well, there, I wish there were a uniform agenda. And frankly, that's the role of these five films right. is to influence the way people think about veteran problems so that maybe we can move toward a unified agenda and everybody will be on the same page going, what can we do to complete this rite of passage for veterans? to make this experience be more integrated into their lives so that they can extract meaning and, and benefit from the terrible wounds that they might have suffered, not just physical wounds, of course, but emotional and psychic wounds. So we don't have that now. And there's something like over 73,000 nonprofit organizations that serve veterans. And in a sense, they're all doing, uh, you know, most of them are doing very good work, but it's like sort of one small piece right. of this giant puzzle. And, uh, and I think that, again, the mm -hmm. effectiveness of each of these different organizations would be much greater if they saw that one piece that they were doing, how it, it actually works in the whole, in the grand picture. And that's where you come in. And your and, and your warrior uh, your warrior film project, uh, yes, series. yeah, and exactly, kind of, yeah, and and creating this kind of a network system of interlocking uh, transmission and, and and awareness. Um, what uh, I have someone here who uh, let me one second has uh, is asking what uh, I think it's related to a question I previously asked you, but how did the veterans feel? when they saw themselves in your film? Yeah, well, that's something that I, I have a, a longstanding commitment to do. And that is before I release the film to the public, I always circle back to the subjects. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And I share the film with them. Now, partly it's just a pragmatic thing. I want to make sure I've got my facts right. But also it's, um, it's to help to uh, emotionally prepare them for the story of their lives that's going to be received in the public. Uh, and, and so uh, by doing that, you know, I feel like I fulfill uh, a certain mandate that I've set for myself to do what I can, again, to sort of promote their wholeness. Um, you know, most of them uh, have been uh, very, very positive. They, they like very much what they see, but it does take a little bit of time for them to get comfortable with it. Because one of the things that I do very consciously too, I don't prettify things. I'm not going to play a Pollyanna role here and pretend that there are not real horrors and real pain and real suffering that goes on in all of these lives. No, I put that front and forward, you know, and so uh, so that the audiences can see it. Yes, but the veterans themselves, they're often not used to seeing all of that darkness about them presented so publicly. So they have to get used to that. But usually once they get over that hurdle, they realize the benefit of it and that they can see that the story that I'm telling shows that that's the bottom, you know, that they've done this kind of U-shaped journey and they've dropped down to, into the bottom, but they've come back up. And now they're integrating more meaningfully the, that darkness into their ongoing life in a productive way. Have you followed up with the, the fellows from from the time you made the film? The oh, yeah. No, I stay in touch with them. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're they're kind of like friends, you know, a lot. of. I mean, I, I enjoy chatting with them. And, um, uh, you know, Malik comes right to mind. Malik Scott, uh, yeah. African-American uh, who's in our film Leaving It on the Land. Uh, beautiful man who lives in New Orleans. I love it when I uh, have the time to get on the phone and catch up with him. Uh, I just enjoy him very much and our relationship very much. And he's just one example. I mean, it's really true about all of them. And now we we take what we have right now and expand it a little bit, because this is what you were referring back to your original, the idea of toxic masculinity. And it seems that per permeates this culture in general. So what advice do you have or what do you have any projects for, not necessarily men who have gone to war, but for people who are, or for maybe for men who are sort of stuck in between. Yes. Because, well, yeah, they all, many of them are out there doing things that are not reflective of their age. And yes. that seem to betray something that's missing. What uh, advice or what? Yeah. Advice? Well, I, I have a whole chapter in the book, Rights to a Good Life, called Mature Masculinity. Okay. So I lay it out in a lot of detail about what it takes uh, for men to leave toxic masculinity behind. And I, frankly, I don't like the term toxic masculinity. I, I use the term suspended adolescence. Suspended adolescence. So, so many men, even though they're 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, are still living out their lives like teenagers, you know, and they haven't really stepped fully into adult maturity in many ways. So, you know, just very quickly, I mean, I can talk about five or six things which are hallmarks of mature masculinity to me. One is accountability, a willingness to be accountable for all your decisions that you make and all of the impacts of them, uh, intended or unintended. Uh, a second one is emotional uh, intelligence, EQ, right? Men need to develop emotional intelligence. Right. And we are not taught this in the culture. So we have to go out and seek it, okay? Uh, a third thing is that sense of, uh, of deep purpose or mission, if you will, which veterans already have by virtue of their service. They, they're doing the government mission. The challenge for them 
is to supplant that government mission with their own unique soul mission when they come home. So they have to discover that soul mission. But most individuals have the same journey. We have to discover what we're here for and what drives our lives toward meaning. Uh, a fourth thing is uh, uh, shadow. Everybody has some kind of darkness that they hide, repress, and deny inside of them. And I use the term shadow. It comes from Carl Jung, who was a student of Sigmund Freud. You can read all about it. But until we come to terms with our own darkness and learn to love and accept our own darkness, we are dangerous individuals, all of us, and, uh, and not just veterans, although they may be more so by virtue of knowing how to use a gun. <laughs> but so that's another key point. And then maybe a fifth one is uh, service. You know, learning that me fulfillment in life for not only for men, for all people, comes through service. Right. It comes from understanding what our mission is, our, our deep purpose, what our gifts are, and giving them away to others so that we can see how we positively impact other people around us. That leads to joy and fulfillment. So and, uh, that I've experienced throughout my life, uh, and that keeps driving me forward. Uh, and maybe a sixth thing I would add, and that's learning how to live in community with men. Because in this society, in this capitalist dominant era, we are taught to compete with men, to compete with each other. We have to learn that we can live cooperatively with each other and work together. So these are some of the hallmarks, I think, of mature masculinity. Well said. I do believe that hits all, checks all the boxes there. Um, now, uh, in terms of your uh, moving forward, what uh, obviously with this pandemic has sort of put a dent on a lot, a lot of our plans, but what are your, uh, if you were to lay out a very broad timeline, say next year, a year and a half, where do you see this, these projects uh, going into and, and, and are there any film, uh, other film projects that, or documentaries you're working on? Well, yeah, I, again, I want to finish the long form rites of passage film. So I hope to be doing that uh, this year to be shooting it and then releasing it in 22. So 2022, um, you know, I definitely will be continuing to send my book out. Uh, I'll be recording the audio book uh, in a month. And uh, and the hardback, uh, I mean, the uh, yeah, the hard copies are going to be available also in about a month. Uh, so we'll have those available for sale. Uh, and I'm also doing through Warrior Films, and I encourage your listeners, if they're interested, just go to our website and sign up. Because I, I do talks like this. Uh, I'm going to try to do it once a month. And I'm going to take a film off the proverbial shelf. <laughs> I have, after 45 years, I've got about 23, 24 films and either show entire films or parts of films and then discuss the relevant issues involved in them, as well as share my writings and other things. Uh, so I'll be doing that. And you know, I also continue to send out regular newsletters uh, to all the people on our mailing list uh, to just keep them informed about what I think are positive, life-affirming, sometimes hopefully very funny, things that I run across that I like to share with our family of supporters. And, and lastly, for those who are, uh, we, some of our audience are future documentarians and directors. What advice will you give them right now regarding choosing their, their proper subject or product, proper topic? Well, I would say if you're asking yourself, what do I choose? It's, it's, it's already the, the, the equation is wrong <laughs> because topics choose you. Okay. <laughs> topics choose you. And if you're really um, uh, grabbed and held by a subject that you just can't let go of, you can't stop thinking about, you can't stop wondering about, then you know that's the right subject. And that's in order to scratch that itch, you've got to make a film about it in order to figure out what it is you want to say about it. 
So that's that's what you need to look for. Great. Well, and now for any information regarding your current and future, uh, all our audience should check out warriorfilms.org, correct? Yes. Well, it's been a great talk, uh, uh, Frederick. I mean, uh, it's well overdue on, on my end. Um, I always always share an interest in with the vets and their plight, and and hopefully uh, we can uh, you can help us bring more awareness and compassion uh, to uh, that is so much needed in this culture, uh, especially for these for these men who fought for our wars, whether we like them or not, they fought for us. So good luck with everything, and I really uh, will definitely stay in touch. And thank you again for sharing your time and your thoughts on this. Well, my pleasure, Daniel. You know, it's me living my mission, right? Right. <laughs> so I get to I get to share what excites me and and makes me happy. So so thank you. Yeah, I really appreciate you. Thank you, and you have a good day and stay well, and we'll hear from you real soon. Okay. You too. Bye bye now. Bye bye. Well, folks, this ends the uh, Psychedelic Film Festival uh, edition interview with Frederick Marx. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll be having more of these in the coming uh, weeks and months. So please subscribe to our website. Currently is the Philip K. Dick Film Festival, where we focus more on science fiction. But very soon, we'll also will have a Psychedelic Film and Music Festival, uh, something we'll uh, be exploring and expanding for the rest of the year. So uh, all of you stay well. Thank you very much and God bless.